pause from the recording and just thank you all for uh, taking your time to do this event to help support my campaign. Um, of course, you know, I'm honored, Karen and LaRonda, for the work that you've done in our community to make sure that the youth activists um, know about the street, the, uh, the work of the freedom fighters and the struggle for civil rights. And so, yeah. Thank well, you. I'm honored to be here, <laughs> I will say. Mm -hmm. I'm you with your mayor campaign because I just think you'd be the best mayor. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Well, I'll, I'll let y'all take over. Thanks again for doing this for me, and I'm happy to be here. Our All virtual right. house party. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep admitting people. Okay. Okay, great. So our presentation begins with um, a civil rights song called Everybody Wants Freedom. So if you know the words, please sing along with me. All right, we're gonna do an acapella today, just like, just like Karen and the rest, uh, uh, and the rest of them did while they were marching. So, everybody wants freedom. Everybody wants freedom. Everybody wants freedom. Freedom. Freedom, fight for justice for freedom. Fight for justice for freedom. Fight for justice for freedom. Freedom, freedom. Oh, everybody needs freedom. Everybody wants freedom. Everybody wants freedom, freedom, freedom. Karen. Okay, I'm not able to hear Karen. There we go. All right. I'll start again. Thank I was 19 you. when I worked with SNCC in 1963 and 64. SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was the young activist group that bravely continued the incredibly dangerous freedom rides and did voter registration in the most hardcore places in the Deep South. Martin Luther King even called us the shock troops of the movement. During my time of working with SNCC, I was arrested at a sit-in to integrate a restaurant in Atlanta, attacked at a Ku Klux Klan rally at Stone Mountain Stadium in Atlanta, and worked as part of SNCC staff in Greenwood, Mississippi during Freedom Summer of 1964. I was so blessed and so changed by these, by these experiences. This presentation today is dedicated to my friend, Marshall Jones, who was a SNCC freedom singer starting in 1963. Marshall died from the coronavirus on March 29th in Brooklyn, New York. The Freedom Singers were part of the extensive communications department of SNCC that spread the word and taught much, about the, taught much to the nation about the civil rights movement in the Deep South. Their songs deeply touched and beautifully expressed the struggles of the civil rights movement. Earlier, LaRonda sang us a freedom song, which we often sang during the movement in the South. The words of these freedom songs were changed to fit the time and the fight for justice, but the music was mostly based on Negro spirituals. Back in the day, as we faced very uncertain and very dangerous days, it was this music that filled us with faith and our burning vision of justice. It was, the music literally transformed our very real fear into inspiration and action. LaRonda will now sing Guide My Feet. 
All right. And again, if you know the words to these songs or if you catch on, please um, join me in singing them. And, and I know that it'll bless your heart as it's blessed, as it's blessed mine. All right. Guide my feet while I run this race. Oh, guide my feet, Lord, while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Lord, I don't want to run this race in vain. Oh, God, I sit while I run this race. Oh, God, this city is yes, while we run this race. God, I sit while we run this race because we don't want to run this race in vain oh god got our vote yes while teresa runs this race oh god got the vote yeah while teresa runs this race yeah. God got our vote yeah. while Teresa runs this race, cause she won't run this race in vain. So it's got my heart, got my heart while I run this race. Oh, God, my heart. While I run this race, guide my heart. While I run this race, cause I don't want to live my life in vain. Thank you. I'm about to read you my all time favorite quote from the freedom movement. This is a story taken from an interview to overcome fear. It is Charles McLaurin, who was born in 1941 in Jackson, Mississippi, and learned lessons about demanding freedom early in his life. His grandmother had graduated from Tuskegee Institute, a historically black university, and owned a restaurant and his grandfather had defied the Ku Klux Klan until night runners, night riders ran him out of Mississippi. In Mississippi, so many families had some of this history of, of uh, their grandparents or their parents having been run out of Mississippi or threatened or, you know, just a lot of that really dangerous, uh, scary stuff. In the summer of 1962, McLaurin had headed SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's voter registration drive in Ruralville, Mississippi. This is a quote from him in an interview called To Overcome Fear. Please listen carefully and see this, how this applies to your life. Sweat beaded on the 21-year-old Charles McLaurin's forehead as he opened the car door and got out. His stomach felt weak, his knees unsure. What he called the fear was upon him. A handsome, broad-shouldered man from Jackson, he stood up as three elderly black women emerged from the black back seat and started toward the courthouse on a hot August day in 1962. He stopped behind them, watching the pride with which they moved, the strong convictions that they held, as if this was the long walk that led to the golden gate of heaven, their heads held high. Earlier in the car, 
The women had told stories of the years gone by while McLaurin drove with knees shaking, mouth closed tightly so as not to let them hear the fear in my voice. When they passed through Sunflower, Mississippi, one woman said, won't be long now. McLaurin's heart jumped, realizing what danger could lie ahead for us, especially me. The women whose, range, whose ages ranged from 65 to 85 knew the white man and his ways. They knew him because they had lived with him and worked for him. At the courtis, courthouse in Indianola, McLaurin stayed by the car as each woman walked up to the white register, registrar and said, I want to vote. His peak moment in his years in the civil rights movement occurred, he said, when these three elderly black ladies had acted in a way that gave him the spirit to continue. He recognized the existence of a slavery mentality that kept people from registering, and he'd learned in the movement that it was not just a black problem, but a human problem. It was a problem of submission People are helpless when young and learn subservience to survive. The women McLaurin drove to the courthouse, found a way to rise above the submission and attempted to reside in the world as free persons. So this is why McLaurin remembered that day in 1962. He fixed in his mind how to live. Now this quote, uh, embodies to me what I learned from SNCC. And that's why I, I love it so much. Because I saw people, regular people who had been, you know, lived in a very scary environment that just stepped above it. And it taught me about not being subservient. It taught me how to get, aim for freedom at all times, inside, and outside for the world, but also my own personal freedom. As I said before, this presentation is dedicated to my dear friend, Marshall Jones. He was well known as a freedom singer and received much attention for his writing of the poignant song in the Mississippi River. He was recruited into the freedom singers by his brother, from the University of Tennessee, where he was beginning to study opera. He was one of the kindest and most sensitive people that I've ever met. And we spent many days walking around New York and reminiscing about the movement and just being friends. Mm -hmm. I would go to New York every year to see my sister and then I'd hang out with Marshall and it was such a treat. Mm -hmm. In addition to the Freedom Singers, Mavis Staples and many other singers have per performed this song. Before LaRonda sings this great song, I will tell you some of the background history of it. In 1964, three civil rights work workers were murdered. James Cheney, a local black man, Andrew Goodman, a white volunteer from New York who had only been in the state for 24 hours, and Mickey Schwerner, a white project director for CORE from New York. These three men disappeared early in the Freedom Summer Project of 1964. After they'd grown for more than a day, we'd called all the jails, and we as staff, knowing Mississippi as we knew it, knew that they were dead. Later, it was discovered that the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was dedicated to keeping segregation in Mississippi forever, they passed on information regarding these civil rights workers to their murderers. They located where they were and told the murderers, who, by the way, were some of the, sh the sheriff and the police in that town. They disappeared on June 21st, and their bodies were found on August 4th. Their disappearance became an international incident. Front page news all over the world 
150 FBI agents were sent down to look for them. And while they were dragging the rivers, they pulled up a number of black bodies, one of them with a civil rights t-shirt on. Of course, the media barely reported these bodies. The part of the point here is that with, when white people got hurt, everybody knew about it. It was an international incident. When black people got hurt, nobody even knew about it. That's still happening. Mm -hmm. Rhonda will now sing Marshall Jones's in the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. This is a tough one to sing, y'all. <laughs> oh. In the Mississippi River, Lord, 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 in the Mississippi River, Lord, 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 in the Mississippi River. They're going to count them one by one. It could be your son. Count them two by two. It could be me or you. Count them three by three. Do you want to see? Count them four by four. Well, into the river they go. We're going to count them five by five with their hands tied they don't come out alive we're gonna count them six by six in mississippi they got it fixed we're gonna count them seven by seven mississippi it show sure ain't heaven they're gonna count them eight by eight they were thrown in because of hate. They're going to count them nine by nine. In Mississippi, this ain't no crime. They're going to count them ten by ten. And we wonder when the right will win. Oh, in the Mississippi River. Lord, 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 and the Mississippi River. Lord, 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 and the Mississippi River. We gonna stop them from going in the river, gonna stop them from going in the river we can stop them from going in the river gonna stop them from going in the river stop them from going in the river stop them from going in the river mm -hmm. Mm. Thank you. The way the women with Charles McLaurin were standing up, not just for themselves, but for the entire community. People in the movement, black people in the movement in Mississippi used to say, I'm doing this for the children. This attitude reminds me so much of Teresa Rayford. <laughs> She is the first organizer that I've seen since the 60s who reminds me of a SNCC organizer. She is such an advocate for the people and especially for the poor and disempowered. She's from Portland and knows Portland and has continued to serve Portland, both in her community center, her free legal clinic, and her reaching out and supporting any family who has lost someone to, gun, to police and or gun violence. I have watched her literally befriend families 
whose sons have been killed by white nationalists or police or community members. She attends trials. She raises money. She gives unbelievable support to these families like I have not seen since the organizers of SNCC. What SNCC did when they were organizing is they so embedded themselves in the community. They so got to know the people. They so much supported them in the problems they had. When a, when a county cut out, cut out all the commodity foods once, one winter in Greenwood, Mississippi, they went and had airplane, they raised money and raised food and shipped airplanes full of food down to feed the people. This is the kind of thing Teresa does all the time. Every Thanksgiving on so-called Black Friday, she has a whole free food for people to come, for houseless and people that need food to come. It's, it's beautiful what she does. She is what we used to call a bottom-up organizer, which is somebody who doesn't try to work for the wealthy of the community, but rather sees the houseless, the poor, the now struggling middle class, and truly wants to serve and help them. Mm -hmm. Teresa embodies this next freedom song. <laughs> this is the truth. That is true. This is you, Teresa. That's right. <laughs> There's so many other freedom uh, people who not only say the words, but actually go out and do it. They put their boots in the streets. All right, join me if you, if you wish. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on walking. Keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Sing it with me. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Turn me around. Turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking. Keep on talking. Talkin'. Marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse. Turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Gonna let no jailhouse turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let white nationalists turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let white nationalists turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let no fear turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let no fear. Turn me around, I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Teresa ain't gonna let nobody turn her around, turn her around, turn her around, ain't gonna let nobody turn her around. She's gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, and she's gonna be Portland's next mayor. Woo! That's right. <laughs> All right. Portland is in the middle of a tremendous crisis with businesses shut down, people isolated and out of work, worried about their rent, worried about their how they're going to have their next meal. As Portland begins to come out of this, who do we want to be leading this town? Someone who has been very slow to help the people who really need help? Or someone who has shown her dedication and her activism to help the people who have needed it most? I believe that Teresa will make a great mayor. She needs financial support. She needs you to send out personal emails. And of course, she needs your vote on May 19th. These are desperate times. Please dig deeper for a person who will really make a difference and also spread the word about her candidacy. 
Originally before the pandemic crisis, Portland and her supporters were gonna knock on every door in Portland to educate all of us about her vision for a just Portland. Since the pandemic and social isolation, she's been limited to mayor forums, Zoom meetings, et cetera, all this stuff online. Please, if you are able, again, donate and also share this event with all your friends. It is particularly urgent now, since the nine, May 19th election, we'll have choices of candidates to run against the incumbent mayor. We want to be sure Teresa is on the November ballot, and that can only happen if you vote on May 19th for Teresa Rayford. Yeah. In addition, voter registration ends for this primary April 28th. If you know anybody who has not registered to vote, please encourage them to register. A little known fact is that people who have been previously been incarcerated can vote even if they were convicted of a felony and have been released from prison. When I was, when I was uh, registering people for, to vote, uh, registering people to vote in 2008, I knocked on this door and this woman answered, answered the door and I said, you know, I'm working for Obama and, you know, have you registered to vote? And she said, I can't register to vote because 20 years ago, I made a bad mistake and I'm a felon. And a convicted, I was convicted of a felony. Now she was, had been living out of jail for 20 years. And the thing is, all those 20 years, she could have voted. Mm. I had to convince her mm. to, that she was allowed to vote. And her reaction was to start to cry. She cried right there. I was a stranger. She cried because she said, I never thought I could vote. I always wanted to vote. And I never thought I could vote. Use this story to tell anybody in your family in your neighborhood, most felons do not know that they can vote. All they have to be is out of jail. They don't have to be, doesn't have to be settled. They can be, before they go to trial, they can even be on an ankle bracelet. They do not, as long as they're not in jail. The other thing about this is that houseless people can vote. And, you know, this is really important. This, these are the very people who need to be represented the most, and they will be so represented by Teresa. We have this opportunity to vote for a really good person to lead this city through these troubled times. When we don't exercise our vote, our voice by voting, we lose out. We give up our chance to make a difference. Teresa can make a concrete difference in all of our lives. Please support yeah. her, step up, tell people. And now Rhonda will sing. We are yeah. so. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Um, this is a, a song we used to sing in church when we were kids. <laughs> so and just like um, Karen said, a lot of the songs, most of the civil rights songs stemmed from uh, the Black Gospel Church. There are we've commissioned a couple of young people um my daughter lauren Steele, in particular to write some freedom songs from the young person's perspective of today um and we're looking forward to hearing some of those and sharing some of those with you down the line yeah but, i can't uh, wait <laughs> yeah yeah she's got a lot to say uh, when she was when she was younger in her teens now she was a lot more uh, angry <laughs> um, in the past few years. Uh, college and life have tempered her, not taking the anger and the zeal away, but using it in a different way. You know what I mean? Not just, ah, I'm so angry, but actually learning um, about society and how people move in this country. And, um, and uh, pinpointing some of uh, having having more of a, a concrete idea about where 
the issues lie and what the problems are. So I look forward to hearing her perspective and other young people's perspective about um, our world, our country, their lives, um, what, it's, what they want it to look like. Yes. So we're going to sing We Are Soldiers. Sing it with me. Well, you know you have to mute yourselves if you're going to sing along because you'll, you'll be lagging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are soldiers in the army. We have to fight although we have to die. We've got to hold up the freedom banner. We've got to hold it up until we die, yes. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to cry, yeah. We've got to hold up the freedom banner. We've got to hold it up until we die, oh. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to cry. We've got to hold up the freedom banner. Yeah. We've got to hold it up until we die. Yeah. We've got to hold it up until we die. We're going to hold it up until we die. That's right. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, Teresa, <clears throat> are there any? Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I had to jump off a couple of times. You know, I'm a crybaby. Yes. So, I'm just thankful. I'm honored. I'm so happy. I was happy to see Coco. I know she wanted to sing along. I showed oh. some videos from when you sang um, in January on Dr. King's birthday, and she was able to perform with you. And I remember when we were organizing everything, I was like, you know, you're going to be singing with important people. And then it happened again at the Portland Art Museum. One of the last yeah. years, all of us got to be together. And so I'm just thankful because a lot of people don't know that I do the work because of my nephew dying or because of our community and the fact that our voices don't seem to matter to a lot of people. Um, and the fact that the arts community and the civil rights community is coming together in so many ways to help us elevate our voices and help us get out the vote during a pandemic. It's like, it's, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Mm -hmm. We are so grateful for you, Teresa, and we will support you in any way that we can. That's right. Any way. Well, you, I just you... wanted to say something today. The, um, the children, the youth from Next uh, Oregon endorsed my campaign. And one of the things about it is they announced the endorsement on the same day of, as Dr. King's uh, assassination. And then today they promoted the information, and I don't think we were even coordinated. So to have those children, that youth, that next generation promoting right now while we're doing this, um, that they want people to register, be registered, to, to cast a vote, you know, a vote for me. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm just thankful. I'll start crying. I'll ask whoever makes this video make sense uh, to edit it out. <laughs> but thank you. I'll be posting it all the way through the 19th to continue to make sure that everybody realizes what their rights are. And thank you so much, Karen, for making that very clear. You're welcome. Thank you, Rhonda, for your daughters. Sarah already knows she came and had me um, putting out in videos last year for getting the SROs out of their school when she was the Black Student, you know, the Black Student Union president. And so at Jefferson, where I went to school. So again, yeah. When I talk to people about a community powered uh, grassroots organizing, they don't realize like we're literally the community organizing the effort to get a candidate that we trust um, to run the city for us and to help us engineer social change. And I think that with everything that's happening, this is the best effort for us to get where we need to go. And I'm, I'm thankful to have your support. And I hope everybody um, checks out the link. We made a, a link directly for this campaign um, this event that's called PDX Civil Rights for Rayford. And so we'll go ahead and make sure that everybody has that so that you can track how many supporters are actually supporting our campaign. 
through your effort, we can hold people accountable that we know and say, hey, even if you don't do anything but give a dollar, you know, donate five, donate 10, donate something. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew, for taking care of us. We just did some revolutionary work by making sure that this is accessible to our whole community. And I'm, I'm curious to where they're gonna be sharing it so that people can hear those freedom songs that have probably never had access. And so hopefully my partners that, here, that are here now will collaborate um, because I think it would be beautiful to be able to learn the freedom songs in sign. You know, especially mm -hmm. in the virtual world. Can you imagine? Woo! Yeah. Woo! Woo <laughs> so let's let's keep being revolutionary. Everybody register to vote before the 28th of this month and make sure you cast your ballot. We'll get our ballots next month. And I love y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. My baby freedom fighter. I miss you. Take it off mute so she can say something. <laughs> miss you too. Miss you too. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Thank love you too. Thank y'all. Anything else, Karen, LaRonda? Well, I just wondered if anybody has any questions of either of us. <laughs> I don't know. I think people are going to see the video of this, and that's how everybody's going to catch on, because, you know, we just organized this week. Yeah. So. <laughs> we were all Four days ago. in Washington, D.C. We were supposed to be out there celebrating the 60th anniversary of the youth organizing and bringing this organization together, and we are not there, so we're here together. And yeah. I thank you. And one more thing I was going to say, it was four years ago this same week that I was on trial for protesting, um, for organizing community. And so again, yeah. I'm like literally uh, a waterfall of emotion um, because yeah. I'm thankful not only to be in good company with our community, but to be in this place where we are now seeking office mm -hmm. in the city of Portland in the year 2020 in the whitest city in America with a very oh, good chance. Goodness. What a very good chance. So thank you. Help me get there, please. Let's show the yes. do this. Yes. Anytime. Thank you. <laughs> you said next year we'll be in DC, right? Yes, we will. Let's all stay home, save lives, and make sure we get there. I love y'all. See you in January you. at the inauguration where we'll be yeah. signing these songs. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. I love y'all. Where do we you. send the donations? Uh, you can, uh, Karen, do you have the information in front of you right now? I don't. Because I made a link directly for this event. Oh. If you found this event, I'll make sure you get that link. Hey, I made it directly for this one so that Karen and Rhonda can track them. Oh, Ty's doing it. We're going to send it out right yeah. afterwards. Okay. She's getting ready to put it into the, uh, the chat for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Bye, y'all. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>